at our intro, our lovely brief intro. Mm -hmm. Amazing. One and a half seconds of a Japanese man beating on a drum. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So let let's uh, let let the uh, truck cast commence. Peak. Uh, what's it? Truck punditry. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yes, rank punditry. So, uh, hold on, but let, let me get the proper picture up, a uh, red cattle car. Yes, here it is. Lovely old Union Pacific cattle car. Uh... Very, very professional setup. Very. I'm sure all our lovely viewers can tell. Uh, <laughs> this is a this is a professional stream, of course. Yeah, it's a well, it's a, it's a cast. We're not streaming live. It's a. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's a, a a very professional podcast. Mm. Audio visual experience with state of the art technology. Who needs like this AA beautiful when you have the old truck antique? Cast? Is okay. <clears throat> so let's get to the uh, roster for. So, what time is it in England? Afternoon or evening? It is four thirty at the moment. Ah, uh, so not. It's, it's, it's still morning in America, barely, but it's the afternoon in England. All right. Mm -hmm. You see, if we had if we had um our Portland friend Coco Cam with us, um, it would be. Incredibly... Oh, actually, she just messaged me. Oh. She just messaged me. She said it wasn't even a power out. She just hasn't been online for a while. Oh. She asked if I'm doing okay. I'll tell her yes. We're doing a podcast this right might... now, and ask her if she'd like yeah. to talk about life in Portland. This might be a a bit of a shock to her, but let's go for it. <laughs> Yes, it might. All right, let's uh, let's go for it. <clears throat> uh, Reddit is taking too long to load, as always. Right, so you say say things to keep the audience entertained. We don't want dead air. Um. <laughs> yeah, well, well, we're gonna. Oh, might as well say the agenda for tonight's truck cast. Yes, go over the agenda. Yeah. Um. So. So, rank. So we're gonna go for some. We're gonna start with some peak. Rank punditry. It's going to uh, consist of life in Portland, possibly from our friend Coca Can, although that may not happen just yet. We will see. And then, second, uh, in our rank punditry, we're going to be talking about um, British versus American. So, we're going to be comparing cultural differences, uh, local dialects, um, words, phrases, and just the general language, really. And then, for the more Philosophical musings. We're gonna um, be comparing. Uh, we're gonna be talking about some of the Bronze Age pervert critiques of um, Christianity. And what is how we phrase it? Churchianity. And the kind of differences between the two. Then we've got um, where did it all go wrong? Which is, I mean, I've given a few dates here that I'm sure you could fit in anyone you wanted. 1990, 1960, 45. 14, 1800, the 1790s, the 1520s, or 10,000 BC. Um, next steps for Dawnshire, perhaps. So this uh, kind of will explain what Dawnshire is, I guess, when we get around to that. And why do we become right-wing? So is it kind of nature or nurture? And then I'm sure uh, my friend King Lobster will be uh, mentioning some 
of his own discussion topics. So that, that's the that's the agenda. Lovely Englander, lovely. <laughs> uh, so I, I I am messaging Coco Can right now. Uh, and uh, oh dear, no. Button and okay, good. Everything is uh, is good. I I just sent her the question and I will uh, wait for her to respond. Now, wh while we wait for our good friend Coco Can to uh, respond, um, yes, yeah, so let's go. Let's see the events tab. Uh, the thing is, if we get a third person onto this, if like one of us has to go, you can still for a few minutes. We can still carry on. Keep them going without just having awkward silence. Yes, we 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 won't have to. It, it'll be a little bit less of a horse and pony show. Mm. <laughs> yes, which actually is a nice segue into British versus American uh, stuff. Yeah. So, Englander, uh, what are some interesting turn like? Uh, uh, like phrases or uh, or metaphors or uh, th th that sort of thing. Interesting, uh, like uh, linguistic spices, we might call them. Yeah, I mean, we could start with um, sort of Cockney rhyming slang, but that's kind of that's quite overdone. You can probably see on YouTube. So I guess we'll start with some other yeah, stuff. Yeah, Cockney. Uh, what's it like calling beer Britney? Because like, oh, Britney Spears, bubbling <laughs> beers. Yeah, you know the apples and pears, lo uh, loaf, um, loaf of bread, all that kind of thing. Yeah, that's, that's all. That's all be done to death. So I guess I'll just mention some other stuff. <sighs> also, it's practically dead as well. The Cockneys yeah. were all mm. driven out of uh, London. I recently, I understand. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a bit. And of all a these people that have from London, in terms of working class kind of. Yes. People. Well, the funny thing is that it's it's white flight, but it's very lower class white flight. Yeah. I mean, the middle classes have still pretty much stayed where they are, you know, yes. hippified those areas. And 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 the really terrible thing about it is that you know, like the Cockneys, they're sort of like a, they're almost Native American, or well, not Native American, they're almost indigenous people, you know, like they've been yeah. there since the time of the Romans, you know, like back when it was New Troy Town. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, in in the Roman Empire, they they talked about these funny people uh, near the area of New Troy Town with a funny accent. Yeah. I always remember seeing, I think it's something that Roger Scruton presented. Um, he was going through like the whole of London and was talking to people who just had grown up around that area and just seen the huge amount of change that's just happened to it. So, um, I mean, with my with my family, my, sort of my um, grandparents, they they're sort of descendants was their ancestors sorry and sort of have been hanging around london and that kind of area for years upon years but it's only now when they've actually had to had to uh flee that's probably the only word i could describe it anyway let's not get too uh let's, let's, let's keep to the rank um <laughs> yes, let's, before we get too, before we get too depressing. Let, let's save all the yes, yes. Let's save all, all for the uh, later section of the video. Mm. This is the beginning. It's supposed to be fun and yeah, silly yeah. and rank. <laughs> uh, so this is the one I quite like. It's um within my uh, it's within Norfolk, so that's one of the uh, southeastern counties in the UK. So this is so Bobby Dazzler. You heard of that before? The what? If you heard of a Bobby Dazzler before? Bobby Dazzler, no, yeah. that that almost sounds like some a joke that an American would make about England. <laughs> um, any guesses? So what it also, would be? maybe. Uh, well, I know that you call your cops Bobbies, so maybe it's it's some kind of a horrible euphemism for something. Uh, no, it's Bobby Dazzler is a, is a. a Name for a bumblebee. Oh, but <laughs> ah, that reminds me. Of course, isn't it the old Anglo-Saxon for bumblebee is Dumbledore, as well? Um, that's no, I, I, not not what I've heard of. Uh, 
All right, that 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 was just a, that might it was something that I heard from a from an apiary class at a because you know I, I've been homeschooled virtually my whole life, basically mm. since the uh, second grade. Uh, for you British people, that means basically since I was about eight years old. Uh, let's see, I'm I'm I'm, na I'm nineteen now, so basically uh, for uh, for like ten years of my life, for uh, you know like ten years of a uh, basic education. I was homeschooled, uh, and my mom basically did a thing, because uh, homeschooling is quite common in the United States, where she got together with uh, like a dozen, or sometimes it was more than two dozen, other uh, homeschool families, and we, we called it like a co-op. It was like uh, basically one of the parents would teach a class a bit like an ordinary teacher, and, and we had all these uh, sort of neat like science classes and even like survival training with with a uh, military veteran one of the dads of one of the families was like a military veteran and he taught us some like basic uh field survival training stuff mm. uh like how to make uh, uh snares and start fires and stuff like that also taught us how to gut rabbits nice well so all good stuff. Anyway, yes. <laughs> carrying on. Um, I just realised, slightly embarrassingly, that I had got. Oh. Go on, sorry. Um, I right. I just realised like, I got a little bit off track. Um, it Going was it was something there. about. Yes, you mentioned Bobby Dazzler. Right. It was the where I learned that supposedly an old English word for bumblebee was Dumbledore. Mm. What was from the uh, one of the uh, mothers? I think it was actually the the wife of the uh, military veteran that was teaching us survival craft. Yeah. She had they, they had like a homestead farm type thing, and she had some bees. And uh, one day she actually brought like a whole like apiary. She didn't actually bring the bees, but she she brought like an empty beehive and like a half dozen jars of honey from around the world, so we could see all the different tastes, uh, textures, and colors of honey from around the world. It was actually surprisingly uh, very uh, broadly varied. Mm. Um, like one of them was slightly crystallized and actually tasted very minty. I think that was the uh, honey from France that she brought. Yeah, well, um, some of the, some of the best things about going around to areas is just picking up the kind of local, those kind of local things, especially honey. I mean, um, yes, around, it around varies UK, very widely. Yeah. Um. Anyway, and and her like a neat little bit of bee lore, you know, because uh, uh, you know, because like you know, like, all, all these um. All of these mothers were sort of like younger generation X, older millennial types, you know, in their uh, late 30s, early 40s. And, um, gosh, it's funny to think the millennials are getting into their 40s already. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh... Well, you know, like, all these kids had sort of uh, grown up, like, uh, with second-hand Harry Potter from their parents. And so she was like, oh, you know, it was a bit of, a, like, Harry Potter lore was that uh, Bumblebee's, supposedly Dumbledore, was named after some old English word for Bumblebee. To be honest, because of this, the fact that there's so many dialects and uh, regional vari variations across the UK, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Dumbledore was a thing. Is it just as a word for a bumblebee? So, mm. yeah, but it also might be like uh, something more of a modern urban legend, since uh, you know that is developed in the time after Harry Potter. Yeah. Um, but but also it you know what's it wouldn't surprise me if bumblebee was literally just an old English word because J.K. Rowling. For all that the Harry Potter books are, are good, and they've aged well, and they're probably going to age well in the future, she was kind of lazy in many ways, and, you know, like, uh, some of the magic spells she straight up stole from, like, Latin mass that she had learned as a child, because she is Catholic, I believe, isn't she? 
Um, or is she Anglican? I'm not too sure. Yeah, she's definitely Christian of some form or another. <laughs> she she's some kind of like the progressive left wing British yeah. Christian, which yeah, at this point could be Anglican or Catholic because. I mean, the Pope put his foot down recently, which is something that pleases me. He said that uh, he said that people who get dogs instead of children are uh, are being selfish. And then everyone was like, "Oh, what about what about? Isn't the birth even isn't having children bad for the ecosystem?" Mm. And uh, all I could think was, "Well, you don't necessarily have to make the child yourself. There's plenty of poor, star- starving children across the world. Yeah. You could adopt one or two. That reminds me of back in the days of Paul Joseph Watson, you know, when he was going on about uh, the hypocrisy of various celebrities for not bringing in migrants. Those were the days, though. <laughs> back in the days. Yes. Um, feels like it's slightly less mad than today. Yes. But, but of course, you know, it's also it's like being LDS, you know, being uh, what, what you Gentiles, uh, but I'm saying... Uh, all all fun and games here call a mormon i was like we do believe that like our family is forever you know like you still got like a familial connection in heaven and uh, for that reason we take adoption much more seriously than uh, most other religions because now it's like when 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 you adopt a child you know it's like they're they're being sort of like grafted into like the family tree you know and it's like yeah just as like every other member of your family is going to be with you in heaven they're going to be with you too, you know, it's like, yeah. um, so that just might be a, a somewhat personal, like, cause that is a thing that I've noticed is like Americans in general seem to take adoption more seriously and, and uh, regard it in much higher esteem than people around the world. But then also mm-hmm. members of my religion seem to hold it in even higher esteem than uh, ordinary Americans. Yeah, the perspective over here in Britain is, I don't, pe- people don't really, they think that adopting someone is like a, it's, it can have many sort of problems, it can go wrong, so you know, you, you don't really bother, because it's, um, it's far easier just to actually have a child than to have one that could, I don't know, could be completely mischievous or something. Well, yeah, but that's the same trouble with, like, giving birth to an ordinary child, you know, it's, mm. uh, kids can always be mischievous. Yeah, it's just the fact that if you're adopting a child who's, I don't know, already grown to, grown up without the parents for about a few years, there's a sort of concerns about that. As I, that's the kind of sense I get in the UK. If there's any other, if there's any viewers who have their comments, um, Make well, that well, that was a good segue back. That was a good segue back into the meat of the conversation. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't. That wasn't. Did get... That wasn't on purpose. <laughs> I know, but it was nice. That was a nice loop. You know, I, mm-hmm. I got us out into the tangent about my my crazy homeschool upbringing and uh, <laughs> you know, like learning how to butcher rabbits, yeah. and and then you uh, brought it back with another nice tangent back to the meat of this section of the conversation. Which is American versus British culture. Yeah. Uh, well, um, I have to slightly embarrassingly, I do actually have to correct myself. Bobby Dazzler does not mean Bumblebee. After all that, um, oh dear, <laughs> I feel I feel ashamed because I I do hear that quite often. I just I've looked it up, and do you know what it means? It means something um, sort of surprise. You you show surprise at something. Oh, that's a that's a Bobby Dazzler. I feel, you know, I've, yeah, I've, that that's what I would have assumed because dazzling is like surprising. Yeah, I tell you what, I was, I tell you what, I confused it with, um, which will we can segue on to the next word. Um, yes, this is another Norfolk word. We might as well stay on the county for now. Uh, Bishy Barnaby. What do you think that is? It's not the bumblebee, by the way. <laughs> A what? A Bishy Barnaby. No idea that. I is is that one because I understand in England you've got like mutton dagger and you've got like a million different euphemisms for penis. Is that just one of them? <laughs> no, it's it's on the theme of insects. That's why I 
it reminded me of that. Oh, Bushy Barnaby. Uh, is it like, is it a, is that a spittle beetle? No, it's, um, oh. it's a ladybird. Oh, a ladybug. Oh yeah, you say it, that's, uh, you say it differently, don't you? In America, you say it like ladybug. Yes. Nah, that's, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to say it's weird you call it a ladybird. It's not a bird, it's a bug. It flies, doesn't it? It counts. A fly flies too. A bird <laughs> flies too. You know, butterflies fly. <laughs> they're not. They're they're not. You know, like flower birds or whatever. True. Oh. Yeah. Well, I mean, we could pick holes in both both uh, variations, can't we? Things. I'm, I'm curious to know yes. what your own, what your own kind of words that you have, if you have any, in America. Or in your state? Uh, well, there are... Uh, in the past, there might have been some stuff that was... But, yeah, basically, since the advent of television and radio, the whole South has sort of uh, broadened up quite a bit. Yeah. Uh... Anyway, um... So I guess some general southernisms will be like uh, people will talk about molasses like oh that slows molasses. Mm. Um very often there'll be a lot of like a sort of like comparisons to animals you know like oh he ain't too smart but he, but he's got horse sense in him. Um and that that's not even a very good southern accent by the way. It's a it's a very for one thing, I'm just talking a little bit too fast, and for another thing, it's it's a little bit... It's more of like an Appalachian accent, you know, like almost anyone from, like... Uh... What's it? You, you might find people in, like, Virginia, West Virginia talking like that, depending. Oh. I don't know, it's, it's a bit hard for me to get a good southern accent going because uh it's it's similar enough in some ways to a british accent especially when i'm talking to you that i i, I often find myself slipping into an english accent mm. you, um, seem, you seem to be very good at accents just generally at least best yes i do try my best would, would, you, would you like to hear would you like to hear like a the german would you like to hear the german <laughs> Go on, then. Yes, well, it is, it is simple, really. He, he would say, re really, really, he, he would put it mm. gravely. Really, it is ver very simple. <laughs> really, it is very simple. Oh, it's your sort of, well, well it's, it's not quite, it, it, it's not quite like the, the Welsh. <laughs> No, but it, it, there are some guttural elements which do vaguely resemble it. Uh, resemble it. Uh, there's also, you know, the, the, the throatiness about about R is uh, somewhat somewhat similar to like the the French. Uh, but of course, I I do not know enough French to. Uh, oh no, I'm slipping a bit into it there. Uh, what's it? Uh, Speaking of like languages, I don't want to learn proper French. However, I do want to learn Quebecois. Quebecois, uh, you know, because uh, tabernacle and all that. Uh, because, well, because I'm a stubborn American and Dad Nabbit. If I'm going to learn Frog, I'm going to learn American Frog. Well, surely it can't be that different, can it? The variations it, between it the is. French. It is. Well, for one thing, the uh, the British style of French, like you've often heard probably that the American style of English is a bit archaic compared to the British style. Yeah. There, there's all sorts of old words that we use that, uh, ironically, you can find in Shakespeare, but you're not going to find a lot in modern. I mean, we talked about that yesterday, um, didn't we, with the yeah, yeah. accents? Yeah. Yes, the same exact thing happens with French, and in so like in the sort of in the Quebecois dialect, 
uh, versus what is um you know versus the Cajun dialect you know like in America and even the uh, in Maine you've got the uh, the Huguenot dialect um the the you know the Protestant French mm-hmm. that settled yeah. in New England. You know, so the thing is, you've got like three different North American French dialects. Uh, four, if you want to count uh, the the Caribbean patois, like a uh, Haitian Creole. Uh, anyways. Uh, but but anyway, um, so, so that is partially just the difference, you know, like the difference between uh, uh, Quebecois and uh, f- and Francais is, is partially that, but also um, well, there are some somewhat major differences in pronunciation as well, a bit like German and Dutch, we might say. Yeah. Uh, you know, so like where a French person would say it's like oh, it's Francais, Francais, uh, a Quebecer would say Francois. <laughs> You know, so, you're, it's, you're, uh, so would you be so you wouldn't be able to a French person wouldn't be able to go into Quebec and just speak to someone then there there would there wouldn't be a conversation they, they kind of could but it'd be a bit like it'd be like uh someone from uh Spain talking to somebody from Italy they'd barely be able to get by yeah. mm. um but of course, the funny thing with Spain and Italy is that there's so many different dialects, you know. Like uh, in, in northeastern Spain, near France, you've got a completely different language in Basque, which is more similar to Finnish than it is to any other language in Europe. Mm. It's, it's, it's a pre Indo. It's Basque. It's a pre Indo European language. Uh, that basically means that the ancestors of the Basque people. Predate. They basically predate the white race. They're not even Aryan. They're more primitive mm-hmm. than the Aryans. They're the people that lived in Europe before the uh, before the uh, Caucasians. You know, the Indo Aryans evolved yeah. in the Caucasus Mountains. But, you know, so they they've basically been. They're sort of like the. Uh, they might be considered the European version of like Native Americans. They've been living there for like twenty thousand years. Mm. Whereas ordinary Europeans have only been living there for about uh, ten thousand years. Yeah, I mean, even even the English, um, we we talk of like having ancient roots in England, but most of us came from the uh, Anglo-Saxons who migrated over from uh, Germany in sort of the five hundred, yeah. six hundred. Yeah. So it's only been about. I know it's like it's one years. and a half thousand years old. Yeah. But of course, then you then you look at like the colonies, you know, and you've got the Boers that have only been in South Africa for two or three hundred years, mm-hmm. and in uh, in in North America, you know, you've got Americans and Canadians, and uh, you know, they've only been living there for you know like uh, three or four hundred years. Yeah. Uh, sometimes, you know, like the further west you go, the the, the shorter it is. Mm. Oh, like uh, like San Francisco is barely a hundred years old. Yeah. Well, I say barely. It's it's more like a hundred and a uh, hundred and sixty years old now because, of course, it was uh, it was the the forty niners and all that. It is actually relatively old, but you know, it was eighteen forty nine. Whereas in England, yeah. you've got cities. Said like England is so old. One of your historical, like, you've got, like, a 500-year-old neighborhood called the New Forest. Mm. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? America's just such a new um, creation in the grand scheme of things. Um, yes. To European countries. Yes, uh, but of course, uh, so th- th- that's where the phrase comes from. In America, 100 years is a long time. Mm. In England, 100 miles is a long travel, is a long distance. Yeah, I'll probably shorten that to about 20 miles, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, of course, you know, it's like you, you, you're like 18 years old or whatever, and you've yeah. never even you've never even left the, the, the county, have you? Well, I have. I was, I was, uh, I was uh, exaggerating, but 
<laughs> um, but generally, you've hardly left the county. Yeah, but generally people don't travel outside of their own county, depending on how big it is. So, um, say you're in, say you're in London, you live in Greater London. The um, you would prob most likely not leave that area unless you sort of your job required you to, and you would spend about ninety percent of your time in just that one county. So it's with everything being about less than half an hour drive away. Yeah, which sounds a little bit mind boggling mind boggling for Americans because you know we've got all these great highways and uh one of the classic sort of American uh, pastimes or sort of holiday, I, uh, when an American takes a holiday, one of, the, one of the main things that he will do is he will go on a road trip. Mm. Um, you know, because we've got all these giant, you know, like highways and freeways and stuff that were actually originally designed for uh, military deployments. That's why the roads are so sturdy. They're meant to support tanks and stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, like theoretically, in case the United States was ever invaded, we'd be able to deploy, uh, you know, like ground a ground assault in, you know, what's I think to drive from sea to to shining the sea, it's like it's less than 24 hours you know which sounds ridiculous to an english person like yeah. my gosh 24 <laughs> hours travel mm. but you know uh for an american for 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 a road trip you know like let's say that you had like a week off yeah if you lived even what's it like you, you might travel you know for like a, you might drive for nearly 2 days straight uh now, in order to go see like a hot spring, or something in a national park, or or maybe to yeah. go see like a slightly larger, more important city than the one you live in. Yeah. We just we just segued really well back into the uh, British versus American uh, differences there. Yes, we're staying shock oh, shockingly yeah. on topic today. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Yes. So is fortunately. So... Go on. I was just going to say, unfortunately, Coco can, uh, sh she's about, she is alive, but she, uh, unfortunately does not want to join us for this episode, so oh. we, uh, cannot talk about Portland. Well, we can leave that to another time then, I suppose. Is there anything yes. else you want to, uh, touch on the kind of British versus American? Um, oh, we, we could always talk a bit about food, uh, yeah. but of course, you I unfortunately both have, we have the odious privilege of being Zoomers. We we've mm. grown up in the sort of a deracinated food culture where yeah. uh, like everybody's got McDonald's and all that. I mean, we say it, yeah, we do. You say that, but as we uh, mentioned before, I with the Mexican situation you... in England, as it's terribly unfair, isn't it? You know, you yeah. you've got pitiful Mexican food in in uh, in England. What's I I once saw a thing. It was a, it was actually a gourmet Mexican place, but their their sort of gimmick was that they only used local ingredients. You know, and since yeah. you can't grow avocados in England, the uh, <coughs> the the ma the uh, guacamole was literally mayonnaise that had been dyed green. <laughs> With uh, it's like a kale extract, mm. and then thickened with uh, with cornstarch. Mm. On the subject of food, um, I don't know if this is something you do in America, but a good majority of Brits cut pizza with scissors. Is that something that's done? Oh over my there? gosh! <laughs> that sounds like that. <laughs> it doesn't sound real to me. No, Americans don't even cut pizza with a knife. What do you cut it with then? We, we cut pizza with a rotating blade at the end of a stick. No, no, no. You, you only do need Do I need scissors. to find a picture? <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm sure they work, but that doesn't sound like anything any real human would do. That I feel like you're yanking my chain, man. <laughs> 
No, it's a it's a thing. Damn it. No, uh, well, my family actually prefers to use a uh, a funky Native American knife called an ulu. Okay. Uh, that that we uh, discovered when we lived in Alaska, sort of an ex- ex- Eskimo, old Eskimo tool. Uh, literally just means woman's knife because, uh, well, you know, those indigenous people are not exactly known for being uh, very uh, open-minded about gender roles. Yeah. Friggin uh, backwater. All right, so, so I will first. I will show you what an ordinary American pizza cutter looks like. Yeah. Um. Th- then I will show you what my family actually prefers to use whenever we make pizza. Because I, I literally have the recipe for pizza dough memorized, like an yeah. old Italian grandmother. So. Mm. Yeah, the, these are pizza cutters. These are all some ordinary. Yeah, yeah I recognize them, but they were there. I've seen them in stores, but I don't think I don't know how many people use them. Uh, basically, most of these are sort of horrible and cheap, though. Uh, yeah. This probably is the only pizza cutter in this whole selection that I'd ever use. Mm. Thing is. This isn't even like a prefab one that you can buy. This is a this is a woodworking kit. What it is is you get the, all this lovely metal bits, and then you get a block of wood that you're supposed to turn out on a lathe. Yeah, which explains the quality, frankly. And uh, oh gosh, <laughs> this is a very typical American pizza cutter, right here. <laughs> Oh, oh yes, um, yeah, no, but I literally do have the memory, uh, or like the uh, recipe for uh, pizza dough memorized, like an old. Well, I say like an old Italian grandmother. I'm sure that if I ever actually tried to Italy, uh, tra- traveled to Italy, I-, I would embarrass them with my my uh, my pizza incompetence. <laughs> yeah, you don't tend to find. I don't know what it's like in America, but you don't tend to find actual pizza in terms of, you know, the, what Italians actually have. In America, you kind of do, but the thing is, like, American pizza is kind of a weird bastard in and of itself because it's it has been sort of bastardized by non-Italians. But the thing is, you know, we've got a huge number of Italians that actually live here. So there's like three kinds of pizza you can get in America. You can get like a like the most basic sort of like Little Caesars, uh, like a beautiful white people pizza. Is that like a uh, very waspy pizza kind of thing? Yeah. Mm. Um, where it's basically just like a well, the most basic, you know, like disc of bread, mm. thin layer of tomato sauce. Is that, yeah, uh, fast food of pizza. like cheap Italian cheese, yeah, yeah. and like, yeah. um, and then you know, like in ter- what terms of like, uh, th- but there's two different versions of like what Italians actually eat, because in America you can find like the American Italian, like the sort of the Italian diaspora pizza, which has evolved into like a half dozen different things across the country. Yeah, you know, so you've got like the uh, the New York style is probably the most basic, you know, with like the thin but flexible uh, crust. Uh, you know, it's so, like you, you sometimes you'll find like uh, basically if it's got a thin but flexible crust, and it's in between, and the slice is in between one and two feet long in between. Uh, what's it? I know that you British people, you're supposed to use metric, but you famously actually use uh, imperial most of the time. Would most of the uh, British audience already know what, like, uh, a tw- 12 to 24 inches is? Yeah. Um, in okay. Zoomers, it's getting a bit turning towards metric, but it's, it's still inches are still mainly used. For, for that kind Beat of them with a ruler like a nun and and hammer the old fashioned material <laughs> into their head. We must not. Well, we must never forsake our heritage. That is, that's a hill worth metric dying on, is, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> yes. Metric is a horrible French invention 
that ha- that is meant for scientists mm. and it has no place in in the uh, in in the mind of the ordinary person i will admit though that uh, the r rulers they are they're all done in meters and centimeters so <clears throat> there are there are, there are a few which have the kind of both of them so they've got one inches on one the side and, yeah but uh, that yeah there's uh... always meters and centimeters in rulers on rulers I need to send you a supply. I need mm. to order like a like a pack of like a hundred cheap wooden rulers to <laughs> Yeah. The thing is it's yeah. a it's a We need reinforcements on the <laughs> British front. It's a, it's a British invention, the uh, all the Imperial measurements, so we just ditched all of them or half of them. Well it's with the you um ditched most of it for uh for all this gay French crap. <laughs> it's like with um <sighs> What is it? Yes, uh, Fahrenheit and Celsius. We've completely um, ditched uh, Fahrenheit as a measurement of temperature. Yes, but that I can understand. In what way? Even as an American who, like, in my bones has, like, Fahrenheit and and, and all that, it it is kind of janky. Uh, Hmm. Basically, the only nice thing about using Fahrenheit... Is that is that you uh you can say like oh it was a hundred degrees today. Mm. That makes it sound it, it, boiling. In a... Yeah, it sounds it, it sounds a lot more impressive than like yeah. a forty degrees or whatever that would be in Celsius. That's the same thing with distance though, which is why kilometers have done so well in Britain. Say if you're going on like a run or something, if you you say oh I've done, I've done saying ten, that I've done I went 10K. yeah saying that I went five kilometers once yeah. Like ten k sounds a lot more impressive than four and a half miles. Mm, yeah. Unfortunately, we're going to reach that awkward situation in which uh, I'm going to have to be gone for a minute or two. Though it won't be much more than that. Oh. <laughs> so you're going to have right. to um, do your best to entertain. Uh, the I'll masses. have to. Yes, I have to do my best to entertain the audience. Uh, Indeed. To, okay. I'll be as quick as yeah, I so can. Yes, as I was saying about. Okay. Are you gone now? Well, it appears that the Englander has gone, so, uh... Gosh, I was talking about pizza, and, and we got on a tangent about, about lengths. Okay. So, as I was saying about pizza before, like in America, you know, you got the three different things. you got the fast food, wasp garbage. You've got, like, the sort of the local Italian-American stuff, you know, in which case, as I said before about the, uh, you know, New York style, thin but flexible. Then you've got, like, the Chicago style which is more of a multi-layered pie, you know, it's got like a thick, thick filling of tomato and meat. Um, actually, I'll get a picture for you people in the audience. Uh. That's not how you spell Chicago. I used to live in Illinois. I should know how to spell Chicago. Oh, good old Chirac. Okay. So... As you guys can see, look at this Mondo Thick deep dish pizza. Uh, you know, where you've got multiple layers of cheese and sauce with the, uh, you know, like you've basically you got sauce in the bottom, sort of cheese in the middle, and then more sauce on top. And you've also got like an ultra thick bread crust, uh, or not bread crust, pizza crust. Uh, but of course, you can find it done multiple ways. You know, some Chicago deep dish places. Uh, we'll have, you know, like, they'll have, like, the, the tomato, cheese, tomato, uh, but they'll put a final layer of, not mozzarella, they'll put parmesan on top instead. Uh, so, so you can sort of find it done multiple ways. Here is someone who's put mozzarella on the final layer on top, uh, here is sort of a horrible, 
horrible bastardization. This is a thin crust pizza. I have no idea why why it was labeled a Chicago style. That's heresy. Uh, you know, he, here is somebody who is, you know, and so here are just some different, you know, style uh, versions of the Chicago style. Uh, this is something of a bastardization. The meat is supposed to be a part of the sauce. It's not supposed. You're not supposed to have slices or chunks on top. Uh, but otherwise, that is quite brilliant. Uh, here is sort of authentic. Uh, as you can see, that's very similar to like an ordinary Italian pizza. You know, with the uh, with the big chunks of mozzarella and the uh, mozzarella and and the. Uh, Oh, that's another thing. You know, it's like there's an an American versus an Italian dialect of uh, Italian. You know, Italian even. You know, it's like there's a like, like a lot of American Italians, like you know, in uh, in Chicago, New York, say, "Hey, it's mozzarella." I have returned. Whereas, uh, in... Oh, wonderful! So I was just talking about we we talked about uh, New York style pizza, the oh, okay, thin yeah. but flexible crust earlier. So uh, I was uh, uh, regaling the audience with Chicago style pizza, mm -hmm. in which case there are multiple layers of uh, tomato and cheese. Usually it's something like tomato on bottom, cheese in the middle, more tomato on top. Uh, well, here we have something like uh, a weird fusion of the authentic Italian, like the, the, the uh, what, we might, what we might call the Euro Italian style. Yeah. You know, of basil, mozzarella, tomato. Uh, but it's like in a deeper crust, more similar to what they do in Chicago. Um, anyway, but like basically all of this is sort of like authentic Italian-American pizza. Mm. Uh, this is what the Italian people that live here actually eat and have been eating for the past two or three hundred years. Surely you wouldn't have got much further out of the kind of uh, the east where the Italians came into, would would you find that type of pizza? In well, this is this is Midwestern Italian. This is Chicago yeah. style. Yeah, uh, you know, so, sort of like this is like near the Great Lakes. Um, but, but of course, the there's south, also a St. Louis. Find, yes, would you find them in the south? Uh, like this kind of pizza. Yes, actually, in uh, not not necessarily. All the Italian immigrants to like, I live in Alabama, for instance, and we have a lot of stone quarries. So mm. back in the Second uh, War II, basically from the 1940s up until the 70s, there were some huge waves of Italian immigration into the United States uh, because basically, you know, like we we completely destroyed Italy. There were all these uh, stone masons that didn't have anything to do in Italy. So they basically, uh, a lot of them moved over to America to work in the uh, marble quarries in Alabama. Uh, I believe that the uh, largest marble, uh, like the, it, I believe, I may be mistaken, but I believe that uh, Alabama is actually the heart of the American marble industry. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, they, they go. Did, did, you, did you catch all that? I didn't. Yeah, I did. Following. Give me if that spiel was too long. Uh, so, yes, you would actually find some Italians living in the South, but they'd be very anglicized, very waspy. Well, yeah. I say waspy. More like rednecky. More like uh, you wouldn't be able to easily... Here. On the subject of migrants, I don't know if... Do you know that we have to take... Um, most students in the UK. So when I was when I was younger, we had to take a um, course in migration to Britain. So we had to learn about Italian migrants, the uh, the, the ten ones that came yeah. over during the eighteen hundreds. And um, of course, I of course I have a somewhat you know it's it's a thing that I've heard some British people uh, agree with, and a thing that I've heard some British people express great hatred for is my opinion that basically Britishness is more important than whiteness and uh basically uh immigrants into britain from uh like jamaica and barbados should be allowed 
but immigrants from Germany and Italy and uh, France should not be allowed. It's just something like a, a Commonwealth, Imperial. Style. Yeah, I mean, that's already kind of the way it is with the Commonwealth. Yeah. Um, I, I, I guess it's this, uh, it's just that I, I would make like a, a slightly more xenophobic version of the Commonwealth, perhaps. Mm. I mean, there was kind of that kind of migration policy during the sort of post-war period. So they... Yes, yeah, so with the uh, Windrush yeah, generation. Yeah, exactly. But unfortunately, there was not a huge emphasis placed on the uh, British identity. There was more of an emphasis placed on like, oh, you Jamaican, and look at all this lovely culture we're importing from around the world. Yeah. And it kind of backfired horribly, didn't it? Mm. Um, like, maybe not as horribly as it would for other countries, like certainly not as badly as uh, Germany's immigration today. It's certainly not as bad as Sweden, but not particularly good either. Yeah. I mean, with some of these, with some of the groups that have come in to the country over the past century, I haven't felt the sense that they've brought their cuisine with them, even though, of course, that's a minor, that's of minor importance compared to sort of the overall effect of uh, migration into Britain. But even, yeah, well, I've even, heard you can get some, yeah? Even cuisine, which is kind of the the main talking point um, of the left is talking about, you know, well, we can we can try new foods. We can eat this and do that and see new cultures. Um, even that. The exception of, with the exception of curry and the Indians, basically, no one's brought over any interesting food. Yeah. I mean, you got you got the odd, odd Chinese um, restaurant and that kind of thing, but I don't know how authentic that would be. Again, this is sort of a thing, you know, where like in America, there's like three different versions of Chinese food. There's the Chinese food that they sell to white people and to, well, I say to white people, black people eat the exact same thing because they're sort of culturally <laughs> they wasp. Do, they have a segregation policy in terms of the food that they give out. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, uh, not quite really. Uh, basically, there's the kind of, uh, uh, th there's the kind of the very, very anglicized, very Americanized Chinese food that you'd get from any ordinary takeout place. Yeah. And there's the slightly more authentic stuff that is like what Chinese people living in America have been eating for the past hundred years. Uh, you know, basically since the uh, 1800s, you know, like the Old West building the great railroads out west. Mm. So that was a short interruption, so I will take the mantle. Um, I guess we've pretty much touched all of the British versus American, gone, you know, gone on the uh, usual tangents, but um, I've no idea how long he's going to be. But oh, no, we, we, Sorry, we can continue with the conversation. Uh, okay, my my well. brother just need, my, I relocated my brother's Hot Pockets, and it's lunchtime, <laughs> so he... He was a bit upset with me. Fair enough. There was a, I um, completely forgot what we were talking about. Um, talking we? about cuisine and immigration. Yeah, okay. mm -hmm. Go on. I was talking about how, uh, like, there's three different kinds of, like, basically with every ethnicity in America, they've got three different versions of their food. They've got the version that was sort of modified to fit the sort of the uh, Anglo-American palate. Of like you know like ordinary wasps and uh, ordinary like the stereotypical white American and the stereotypical black American basically. Yeah. Um. And but then they've got the version that like they have been eating since they moved to the United States for like the past hundred years. And then you've got the version that is still e that of that food that is eaten in their home country and has been for the past thousand years. Yeah. Would you say it's um, like with Chinese food? Yeah. Carry on with carry on with your point. So I was going to digress. Well, well, no. I was just going to give the example of like there's the food that Chinese people eat in China, yeah. and you can find restaurants serving that in America. Then there's the food that Chinese people, uh, like the Chinese diaspora, has been uh, eating, you know, in in America for the past hundred years. 
and that food is Chinese, but it's very distinctly American Chinese. Yeah. Uh, and and then there is the like the very sort of fast food, uh, what we might call the Mick World Chinese food, that was uh, basically invent like made just for uh, Anglo Americans. Yeah. Right. So you wanted to say something. I was only going to um, ask. You know, the term the term wasp does that does that generally just include um, sort of um, area migrants from Europe, so you know uh, England, Germany, um, that sort of. Um, area. no, wasp refers specifically to white Anglo-Saxons. So like, oh, so, uh, oh okay. Basically, that's something. It's sort of only in the east that you'll find like waspy people. You know, um, uh, you know, like um, as I was saying, yes, um, you know, so like in in like New England, you've got like proper wasps that are like descended from the pilgrims. Yeah. And then in the south, you've got sort of pseudo wasps that are descended from the Scotch Irish. Mm. Uh, and then more in the Midwest, you get German people, especially in the southern part of the Midwest, like in Missouri, you've got a lot of German stuff to the point where, like, Germ, uh, what's it like, Missouri German Protestant is like it, its own sort of school, like sect of Christianity. So would they wouldn't be considered wasps then, or would they? No, not at all. Okay. Uh, for, for, for large sections of American history, they wouldn't even be considered white. Mm. They'd be considered Caucasian. So, like, scientifically, but not culturally white. Yeah. I guess when they, when they say Anglo-Saxon, uh, probably a better term would just be English. Is that what they're English yes. We're referring to the people that, you know, like, the, the people of Saxony who settled in England. Mm. That's um, it's interesting, really, because I when you see the uh, kind of I was going to say it when you see the kind of um, demographical um, ethnic maps of America, you find it's just especially in terms of area, it's almost completely dominated by um, Germans in the Midwest that sort of area. Yes, it is, because they're the sort of agricultural backbone of America. So what So what made Germans want to go to there, then? German migrants? Oh, because the German people who moved here were basically f like poor farmers from, yeah. uh, from, from Germany that wanted to like have the privilege of owning the land that they lived on. It was very much the same motivation as the, uh, as, as the English settlers that came earlier. It, it's just that, uh, you know, like the English settlers had already been there for like one or sometimes two hundred years, so they developed into like all these uh, cities, and so the Germans basically just settled in the nearest wilderness, yeah. which was basically the sort of uh, the uh, loose forests and rolling prairie hills of the Midwest. Yeah. Oh, which is basically, that's like it, the Great Lakes, and everything sort of like, basically that's everything in between the, uh, Texas and the Great Lakes. Mm. Although, once you go, like, uh, what's it, like, um, I guess I should get a map, shouldn't I? Let, let's get a map, uh, I think we better like close, this, uh, close this, uh, topic after this, because we've Spent like half of the, probably half of the time, just on this subject. <laughs> yes, and I actually need to. There will be a bit of a brief intermission because my mom needs me to clean up something in the yard. Ah, oh, fair enough. That's okay. Uh, speaking of which, uh, if if it's not too much trouble, I'd like you to edit out any uh instances where you, where where you could hear my uh, family say my name. Mm-hmm. That's fine. Okay. Which I don't know. You could, you know, since I don't know how how good this microphone is. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll do my best. It's um, 
All right. Well, I'm not sure it even picked up. You know, going through the audio later, it might not even be that. Yeah, maybe you know. not. Okay, so here are all of the... Um, so this is sort of like the Midwest, but it's kind of like the, well, the Western Midwest. And you've got like the Midlands here, but this is often referred to as the Midwest as well. Uh, the Great Lakes, which is also often referred to as the Midwest as well. Then here you just have the actual, the South. Yeah. Texas is sort of its own thing, but it's also counted as part of the South. Uh, the Gulf Coast is, again, sort of its own thing, but it's also referred to as part of the South. And Florida is sort of its own thing, but it's also part of the South. Appalachia is very much its own thing, but it will be alternately referred to as either the South or, the, or New England. Uh, mm. Mid-Atlantic, very much its own thing, but it's often just referred to as part of New England. Uh... Algonquin, this is basically just, culturally, it's sort of Midwestern, but, uh, like, in terms of, like, heritage and genetics, it's it's more like New England, and language and, and dialect and stuff. Uh, the Southwest, yeah, this is pretty much what most people would refer to as the Southwest, but a lot of people will sort of include the southern parts of the Mountain West and sort of, uh... Everything basically, in, like like a lot of people would include uh, like Southern California and uh, large sections of Utah, Colorado, and uh, Nevada. It's like yeah, this is pretty much the Mountain West. This is absolutely the Pacific Northwest. Um, where you've got the hellholes. And then this is yeah. Portland. Yes. This is uh, this is Coco Can Land, <laughs> and Alaska is sort of its own thing and sort of a part of the Pacific Northwest. Anyway, brief intermission. I must go get the trash. Please uh, entertain the audience while I'm away. I will do my best. Well, I've no idea what I'm going to fill this up with, but I suppose with. With these um, American regions, um, I always considered the I always considered the South to be not as expansive as what is portrayed in here. It's like um, the kind of the cultural spirit of the um, of the South I, tends to reside, at least in my opinion. Obviously, I've, I've literally never even been there, so I mean, what. Um, might not be entirely correct, but I would say in sort of the core parts of the South would be just what people term, uh, say today is the Bible Belt. So just kind of the, you know, the Alabamas, the uh, Georgias, the um, Mississippis, that kind of thing. Um, this, I'm just going to say in advance that obviously the screen is, um, it does lag out a bit. So um, that's due to bad network connection so you know you've got those perennial problems of uh, network connections but you know it's the first 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 truck car so you can't always have everything flawless but anyway um well you've got the uh, so the car low back there we go Anyway, so what, what I was going to mention is that you've got kind of my impression of America, and I guess the British conception of America is basically that there's stuff in the east, and then there's stuff in the west, and it's basically nothing in between. So, <laughs> so I mean, you've got Texas. You've, uh, Flyover country, basically. Yeah. That's what a lot of people call that. Yeah, it's just, which is kind of pitiful, in because terms of it does geography, have like a... In terms of geography, a Brit would struggle to name any of the states in the kind of Midwest section, you know, northern Midwest, where, you know, the Montanas, the North Dakotas, the South Dakotas, Illinois, and that, <clears throat> that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, in, in all fairness, there is really not much there. There's basically a, there, there's a couple of depressing Native uh, Indian reservations. Yeah. Uh, there's a couple of... Uh, 
Well, I guess there's there's actually a lot of beautiful natural landmarks, yeah, but it again, is. it's well, it's because it's on top. It's natural it? geography. Yeah. Like a, a lot of British people could probably name uh, like the Black Hills, or even you know, like within the Black Hills, you've got the artificial monument of uh, Mount Rushmore. Yeah. Uh, Oh, well, but um, they wouldn't be able to tell you what state Mount Rushmore is in. Yeah, you've got Yellowstone as well. That's kind of a, a well-known... Oh, yes, that's in Wyoming. Yeah. That's yeah. in the state that famously doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah, so when I, was, that? I was looking into um, the sort of Midwest states like Wyoming and Montana. They've got... I didn't realize no, how massive the... Um, Wyoming is very much west. Wyoming is far west. Mountain yeah. west. Sorry, yeah. Um, I didn't realize how big the reservations were in um in those that's area. practically independent countries sometimes so they that yes yeah, so they just have autonomy what over what then like the yeah uh... um well like in alaska for instance the indian reservations in alaska are allowed to exercise even uh like capital punishments wow. uh so like uh, yeah, so like if someone committed like murder or or rape on an Indian reservation in Alaska, they wouldn't be executed; they'd be banished. Well, they'd have to survive in the icy yeah. wilderness, which is practically a death sentence, but not a hundred percent. Well, they they're quite impoverished, aren't they? In um, these reservations. Yes. Depending on which uh, one it is, that's partially. Cool. Basically, for a combination of like their own fault and being irresponsible, irresponsible, but also partially uh, through a lot of like uh, the government deliberately trying to poison them and make them poor. Yeah, I'm guessing. Uh, you know, like alcohol. Yeah. Well, I was gonna say, I'm, I'm guessing that's not the um, that policy is long gone. When, when did that? <sighs> yeah. Um. Anyway, I, I gotta, I gotta go clean up some more trash. So uh, please continue can, to keep I'll the do, audience I'll do my entertained. Best, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, with the with the Native um, American reservations, I have it'd be, it'd probably be an incredibly interesting place to you know just travel into because you'd be ex you'd be experiencing an entirely different. Um, customs and way of life obviously it's uh you know very on the western but i don't it'd be interesting for, for um lobster to answer at all about to do with um how their cultural traditions sort of they just have, not, not their culture but their, their sort of systems of government and um how how they interact with just the sort of American government in general now nowadays because um, from I guess going back to the British versus American thing I would say most British people kind of thought Americans came in got rid of the Native Americans and um, you know you only have a really tiny amount and the reservations kind of like a an ancient um, they, ne they never I don't, don't think many people would know these kind of places even existed so if you if you were were to travel into kind of the Montanas and the Wyomings, um, you would I, I would be um, the average Brit would be surprised to see that these kind of huge areas of land in which there's just um, Native Americans, an entirely homogenous community of Native Americans living in. Um. Yeah. Well, in all in all due fairness. I do have to clara uh, cl clarify some misconceptions that uh, yeah, go ahead. The, the the Euro scum might have about <laughs> forgive me <laughs> if that's too harsh. That's uh, might have about Native Americans and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know indigenous reservations and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Basically, they're they're kind of more like trailer parks. It's basically just like white trash sort of ghettos. Yeah. Because most of the so-called Native Americans in America are like only an eighth or a sixteenth or something. Yeah, they're actually very white-looking, uh, to the point where it's never a joke that I've always heard that I've ever heard before from anyone else. But a joke that I like to make sometimes is that uh, powwows are the only acceptable, exclusively white gathering of uh, people in America. Mm. So, you don't, you wouldn't find like an, 
it's a completely homogenous Native American society anymore. Just hundred nearly hundred percent Native American blood and ancestry. Is that is that not real? I'm sure you could, but you wouldn't find it on the reservations. You would find yeah. it more like a you, you can find that sort of thing with some of the Seminole people in Florida. Uh, essentially, where like there's only a few thousand of them left now. Mm -hmm. They're barely able to hold on. Um, uh, they are very wealthy, and uh, you know, like they own casinos and all the usual sort of things that natives yeah. do to, to to make money. But they don't live on the reservations. They they live on private land that they own themselves. Yeah. And uh, they 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 actually are uh, landlords. Mostly, they make all their money off of real estate, buying and selling and renting land to uh, to uh, other people. Reminds me of kind of, um, do you, do you have do you, do you have gypsy camps and that kind of thing over in America? Um, yeah, you can find that sort of thing, but it's not much. You you find you find more. We we do have some gypsies, but like again, they've just sort of dissolved into the larger culture of white trash. Yeah. They're basically just the white trash that move occasionally. Mm. Like the gypsies don't set up camp in the farmers' fields anymore. They set up camp in uh in, in ordinary trailer parks. They don't have the beautiful painted wagons anymore. They live in ordinary mobile yeah. homes. Well, it's the same as us, but we don't really have trailer parks in the same sense. So gypsy gypsy just kind of arrive in areas just where they please. So there's not like, there was this um leisure center. Which yeah. is kind of which is kind of pitiful. Mm, I think was... the thing though that's like the, the, yeah. Well, there was this. I was going to say this. There was this leisure, leisure center um, near near where I live that um, a bunch of um, gypsies came into and just kind of parked all of their trailers in and uh, caravans and just set up camp. So um, that's the kind of they're just kind of seen as pests and nuisances. So I was wondering if. Sorry, go on. Yeah kind of the same thing in America, except we have trailer parks, so they're a little bit more out of the way, and, yeah. and they're not such a major problem for everyone. Mm. Uh, I, I should say, though, the, the state of the gypsies today, and, uh, and, and the other traveling people, because I understand it's not just the gypsies, you've got the Irish travelers as well, and they're a completely yeah. different yeah. Uh, ethnicity, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've got whole different sections of those communities as well. But it's, um, they're sort of, oh. they're generally lumped in to just the sort of... Yeah. The uh, traveling gypsy. people, the tinkers. Tra travelers, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, like, a lot of people are like, oh, but Romani is, is more politically correct. And it's like, well, yeah, but not Romanian. They just lived there for a mm -hmm. while once. The, the same as Egypt. It's, it's not any more accurate of a name. Yeah. Well, it's actually a lot less accurate because the people of Rome, Italy today call themselves Romani. And the people of Romania today call themselves Romani. So it's it's a name that br applies much too broadly. Well, I think that probably um, is a is a suitable time to close on the uh, on this point. Yes, <laughs> on the American versus British differences. <laughs> very long tangents. Some very <laughs> beautiful rank punditry. Mm, indeed. Peak rank punditry. Um, okay, and uh, we, we of course we can't talk about uh, life in Portland because no, Coco no. can unfortunately so is was, pressed for time. I was interested in what you would suggest your your, your, your suggestions for rank punditry. I think we already talked about everything. We talked about food and stuff. Uh, the only th other thing that I could think of is maybe weapons culture because that's something that very uh, much yeah. exists in America but hasn't in in England for like. Like seventy years or something. When 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 did when did your people get so so tough on gun control? So the big event was um, I think it was this this shooting in Scotland or something that killed sort of quite a few people. It was is during and it's kind of Blair era, nine, nine, late nineties, um, and you know, New Labour came in and um, obviously reacted to <laughs> Tony <laughs> Blair. In the Dark Lord himself, yeah, he came in. He really and... is the Dark Lord, Dad Nabbit. <laughs> he came in and um, 
regulate so that that was when pistols were banned he came in and regulated the um sale of firearms and sort of a bun brought in a bunch of restrictions which actually and, yeah um, yeah and it, regulating pistols like that is of course evil like regulating any weapon is evil however at least that actually makes a bit of sense because uh, <laughs> pistols are actually used to commit crime sometimes mm. Yeah. Uh, in America, the most regulated firearms are all rifles, even though you know, shotguns and pistols are used in the vast majority of crimes. Mm. Complete lunacy. I'm just um, but, of up. course, basically, yes? As you were saying? Um, I was going to say, I was going to say, is I'm looking up, trying to look up the uh, massacre that happened in 97. Carry on. Ah, well, I I was basically just uh, going on a short spiel about um. Well, uh, you know uh, about American stuff. What was it in particular? It was the uh, uh, the Dunblane massacre. That's the word. that's the name. Oh, oh yeah. I think I've actually heard of that before. I think that uh. I think Dank might have mentioned that in a video once. Mm. Thank you, look. Yeah, 97. Eh. Yes. Well, they're, they're still... Um, um, I've just mentioned pistols are still legal in Northern Ireland, so... That's where, that's where most no. training... <laughs> of course to. it would be Northern Ireland. <laughs> well, they probably need of it. Of course it would be... <laughs> the bloody terrorists. <laughs> I actually know a guy from Northern Ireland. He's uh, in my uh, local woodworkers guild. He's uh, only been living in America for like four years. Yeah. Well, on the subject of accents, um, well, that we mentioned before, um, the Northern Irish do have a distinct accent to the Southern Irish. It's a lot more harsh, um, I would say, than yes. That actually reminds me. So, would you would you like to find a video of like uh, what's it's it's the nearest thing that linguists have been able to figure out about uh, original Shakespearean English? Um, yeah, sure. Go ahead. I suppose this is a bit of rank punditry, but it's also a bit of a good old history. So, uh, yeah. but let's say that this is a segue out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, oh, basically, it's... basically, it just sounds like Hagrid from the Harry Potter movies. <laughs> While you were away, I was just um, I was just saying how uh, I, I I listened the whole time. It was about you... the uh, Indian reservations or something. Yeah, well, I had mentioned earlier that um, the poor quality of the um. Shakespeare didn't sound as you were saying. Yeah, I was mentioning about the poor quality of the screen, um, ah. the screen sharing. But it's, it's we, we'll, see, we'll see what we can do. It's the first episode, so yes. Carry on there with the uh, video. Shakespeare's English. Yeah. Dear. Well, this was the uh, best one that I could find before, so uh, fast forward a bit to where he actually gets the pronunciation. Archers. <laughs> the you mutiny where civil blood lives. Oh dear. Juliet. Two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona where we lay our. So here's the horrible modern uh, received pronunciation. Mm -hmm. See. From ancient grudge break to new mutiny where civil blood lays civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal lines of these two foes, a pair of star crossed lovers take their life, whose misadventured piteous overthrows doth with their bury their parents' strife. <laughs> Same speech. And this is as close as we can get to what 
Shakespeare's accent would have sounded like, and the accent of his actors. Two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona, where we lay our sin. From ancient grudge, break to new mutiny, where civil blood lays civil hands unclean. From forth the battle lines of theirs two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take the life. Whose misadventured, piteous overthrows doth with their death bury their parents' strife. It's cool, isn't it? I like it. So notice it's much deeper. That was much mm. naturally deeper. Ah. Uh, a bit like Hagrid, a bit like a pirate, a bit like a... Yeah. Well, even, yeah, so some of the, yeah. Um... Well, the funny thing is, you know, like, this is, you know, when did Shakespeare live? You know, it was, it was in the uh, 1600s, wasn't it? Yeah, late um, 1500s, early 1600s. Yeah. Uh, the, the Renaissance, let's put it simply enough. Um, yeah. You know, and like, like a, literally uh, just about like a hundred years later uh, in the United States, you know, it's like a, 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 an accent virtually identical to that would have been what like the founding fathers of America would have spoken with. Mm. Um, oh, and it's it's what's it's, it's deeper and louder and faster all at once. It's a much nicer English, I think. Yeah. This uh, yes, it's um, but, go. On. I was just gonna say it doesn't sound very posh, of course, to modern no. ears, but. With that sort of, with that old poetry, it, it, it dignifies it, I think. Yeah. Um, also, perhaps it does put one more in the mind of like, what an ordinary person going to a Shakespeare play would, you know, like a, it was high art, but it was high art that was uh, digestible, that an ordinary person could have enjoyed. Mm. It's, um... Well, there you go. If you, if you want to pick up um, future tactics of propaganda and uh, meme culture, you can just look, look at Shakespeare and see how he did it and appealed to the appealed to the masses. Yeah, well, what's, it was an appeal to the masses that was not repulsive to the elites. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. So yeah, I suppose that's a. Uh, do, do, do you want? Do you think that we should try and like re-engineer like the whole of Shakespeare's English to try and make like a dialect for Donshire, or do you think that'd be too much trouble, and we ought to just let the Donshire dialect evolve? I think we best outline what Don Donshire is first. Ah, that's true. This is only the beginning of our podcast. We, we've never hardly spoken. We, you know, we, we've hardly even told. Okay, so. Um, for all you YouTube people, both on uh, Englander's channel and my own, uh, you might be curious, what's this uh, Donshire thing we've been referring to occasionally? Um, basically, it's, it's just like a project, perhaps in vain, perhaps it is only a, a, a dear passion or something. Uh, basically, it's just me and, and Lobster and Coco Can, whom you will hopefully meet in future episodes want to uh make li like our own country like a more sort of traditional proper old-fashioned country you know with like uh oh just things are done properly you know like the not purely a step backwards in time you know we're not exactly technophobic but we we don't think that increased efficiency is the most valuable thing I think would be a, is that a somewhat good way of summarizing it, England, or how would you summarize it? Yeah, well, we were we were working on what we were calling the fundamentals in terms of the kind of the the sort of things we're working for in in this. Uh, I guess you would say thought experiment because that's what it sort of is at the moment. Yes, but one that's that we that, hope to yeah. realize um, in the however long it may be in the future. Um, yeah, in terms of efficiency, we we what, we what we're trying to get across is that um, not trying to go back to the Stone Age, but mm, we've just got to reprioritize what um, what we should be looking towards. So, in modern society, we say we 
we adopt new technologies and that sort of thing because they're more efficient because they're more effective at doing something they're adopted widespread so this is what i'm sure if any of the listeners are familiar with um uncle ted and that kind of thing this is kind of goes back to some of his critiques so yes what... now of course of course first you know, whenever you bring up uncle ted yeah, well, yeah. for legal disclaimer, reasons we have yeah. to say disclaimer uh, ted kaczynski was a terrorist who killed dozens of people mm. We, we yeah. do acknowledge that, and we do disavow his actions. Yep. Uh, we, we, we are merely uh, going to be talking about a few theories that he had, which were not completely insane bullshit. Yeah. Um, yeah, as I was saying, so it's the kind of... The increased efficiency is something that in Dawnshire we would not be working towards, because it removes the... And not for its own sake. Exactly. So, some of the things that have been developed at because of ever increasing efficiency are not something that we'd want to be replicating in Dawnshire. So, things like um, what was what we were kind of against smartphones and mobile phones and that kind of thing. Well, I'm guessing when we... Uh, maybe not MP3 players. Maybe you should <laughs> be able to listen to music on yeah. the go. Mm -hmm. But putting it all into one into one little, you know, pocket-sized thing does seem like a little bit too much to us. Yeah. So with um, th that was obviously in, in modern society, it's time-saving. It's it's incredibly efficient just to um, pull up your phone in the middle of nowhere or something, um, or just in in a just in your own home and just to Google something to look up something. Um, but it's in, it destroys a lot of well, it, it destroys a lot of the aspects that we're trying to save in Dawnshire in terms of uh, stuff like traditions, stuff like sort of family values. It's nor was it nor was it beneficial to kind of your own people's own mental well-being to have some kind of um, device like that constantly within their pockets, con they're constantly having to check it, and constantly having to yeah. see what it, any updates or emails. Um, people need to, you know, go offline, I suppose, is what we're trying to, when they're outside, when they're um, outside of their own homes, they just need to kind yes. of log off and switch uh, off. Yes. Again, I... I do feel the need to say we are not uh, not anti-internet. We are not no, anti-Netflix no. necessarily, by any means. Um, you know, it's just that, like you, you don't need Netflix when you're not at home. Yeah, we just try. No. We're, we're looking to just try to remove the worst aspects of um, that modernity has created in terms of technology. Yeah. You know, and like here's another thing. It's it's something that majority of people might find to be like a bit stupid or sentimental or something of me. But uh, you know, like because uh, we had a conversation before about uh, about horses, yeah, versus automobiles, and like a thing. You know, because I had the privilege of learning to ride horses for years before I learned to drive a car. And the thing I've got to say that I've noticed, you know, it's like when, when you're riding a horse. You're not as neurotic as when you're driving a car because if if it's a good horse, he's looking. You're like you're not just looking out for yourself, and he's not just looking out for himself. You're looking out for him a little bit, and he's looking out for you a little bit. Also, that there's a certain amount of uh, forgive me if I sound like a hippie, but there's like a a, a kind of deep spiritual sort of like exchange there. Yeah. You know, about the, these two animals taking care of each other. But because of but because. All we care about today is ever increasing efficiency. All of the fact can be thrown aside and just for saving time. Yeah, um, but also you know, like uh, like it might save a lot of time when 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 you drive in a car, but you're not able to enjoy the scenery. You know, like mm. I live in I live in southern Alabama. Well, southern. I live in central Alabama. You know, there's beautiful forests and hills and things everywhere around here. 
like even in the middle of uh, some of the older suburban neighborhoods, there's trees and, and forests everywhere. But when I'm driving in a car, I'm not able to enjoy it at all because I've got to keep my eyes on the road, you know, and it's like a, because it's a hilly area, the roads are quite jagged, you know, and I, I, I can't quite see the traffic that's ahead of me. Well, and the beauty and of, of course, that... as well was that you were just able to go uh, wherever you please. Um, you couldn't really do the same thing. Yeah, you don't have to stay on the road if you don't mm. want to. You can go out onto the bush if you're on a horse. Obviously, uh, not completely, you know, you can't penetrate the deepest brush, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, the densest brush on horseback, but it's a lot more versatile than a car. But you could go to places where um, the authorities, you know, wouldn't lay down roads for. <laughs> I suppose you could say. Yeah. yeah. Now, there's, there's a certain kind of freedom yeah. with the horse that is even greater than the freedom of the automobile. Mm. You know, like, uh, because, like, here's the thing, you know, I was like, Americans very much, uh, prefer cars over trains because the American is like, oh, I can take my car nearly anywhere. You know, because the American does not want to depend on the state in the way that a European does. Yeah. Um, you know, but the thing is, with the horse, that freedom is even greater because you don't even have to depend on the government to, uh, to, to make roads for you. Yeah. You don't even have to rely on, on the government to make maps because, of course, you know, like, uh, difficult though it may be, there are plenty of companies that, you know, like, privately will, uh, like, cartographers and things, and will make these maps. Mm. I mean, I don't know what the, um, rules are in america but there are a huge amount of areas that you don't really have free roaming the same way no the we... only flaw i would say with america is we don't have free roaming the way that you do in england and parts of europe mm. we have um well what about things like you know national parks what, what are the rules uh yes you can you can travel in federal land pretty much unrestricted uh, depending, you know, because certain places do have endangered species, and so they don't want anyone out after dark because they might be poaching. Mm. Uh, you know, like for example, in many uh, count in, in many places, night vision goggles are illegal to use when hunting because uh, poachers sometimes will use them. Yeah. To sneak onto uh, wildlife reservations. Um, so that's 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 one of the aspects that we'll be just trying to go for in um, Dawnshire, just in terms of um, choosing our technology wisely. It's probably the way I could describe yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um. And uh. Oh gosh, we sort of worked our way back into rank punditry because we were talking about differences between America and Europe. Ah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I suppose like, essentially what, like, if I want to describe uh, Donshire in a bit less of an airy, idealistic way, I would say, eh, basically we, we, we just want to buy some land somewhere mm. and, and just start a little sort of independent, self sufficient community somewhere in the middle of, like, the woods or the middle of the plains or something. Yeah. Uh, probably in, in the United States or Canada, you know, somewhere in North America. But like slightly more technologically advanced Amish communities, basically, I suppose. Yeah, basically just like the, the, the Amish plus radio, mm. kind of. <laughs> so um, I, did, I did put on the um, philosophical musings the uh, next step for Dawnshire, next steps for jo Dawnshire. Um, nice. Have you got any ideas around this? It's probably, obviously, it's still in the thought stage, isn't it? Uh, well, yeah, it's stage. it's not only is it still in the thought experiment stage, but we're like even in the foundations of thought mm. experiment. You know, we like we're even... still trying to hash out how how we would govern ourselves. Yeah, I mean, we're still debating on ideas and discussing um, sort of what would be in the constitution, aren't we? Yes. Well, I'm not sure we've even uh, quite. Well, we haven't uh, even got have there, we yeah. quite gotten to the... Con 
I sp- you know we have a little bit because because uh, we made the decision about about uh, uh, about uh, martial like technique or whatever martial tradition. Yeah, we we decided that um, what's it? Er- basically, it should be like a rule that every citizen in uh, in Dawnshire is armed and trained in in the use of those arms. But at uh, the same time, the uh. As leader. much as possible, but mm. not necessarily a part of like any kind of uh, but, but not necessarily a standing army. Yeah. So that the people would be well trained in us. So like if the time came, then the leaders of Dawnshire would ra- kind of raise them up into a militia, that kind of that kind of thing. Yeah, uh, enough that it would be like a like a skilled like an old British like the, like the yeoman like the longbowmen of England. Not like yeah. the uh, p- the the pitiful uh, French crossbow levies. <laughs> mm. Highly trained elite troops. Yeah, but like highly trained and highly numerous. You know, like yeah. literally one seventh of their whole work week ought to be uh, devoted mm. to like arms and armor. Um. And I guess, I suppose, you know, like, a guerrilla tactics as well, because, uh, like, starting off, we might only have a few hundred people. Yeah, it was good. Well, the whole, it would all depend on where the location would be in the end, for what we would be yeah. training people for. Oh, yeah, you know, because, like, out on the plains, of course, in, in like, in, in the, uh, the flat west, we might call it, mm. uh, y- you'd have to train them in, like, trench digging and stuff. Whereas in the Mountain West, you'd have to train them for, uh... I'd have to know, like, a ge- uh, geology, I suppose, to figure out, like, which rocks make for good cover and which ones are too soft. Yeah. Uh, you know, like, uh, how to, like, you know, like, climbing trees and stuff in those sort of dense forests and things. Yeah. <laughs> um, how to make basic traps, etc. I guess on this topic, It would almost be... Yeah? Yeah, I was gonna say, um... On this topic, that um, weapon, obviously, like in like in America, um, weapon ownership would be an incredibly important part of the, the um, for each citizen of Dawnshire. Yes, you know, like uh, what, like the sort of jokes that people say about like, oh, uh, you know, about Americans like all having like a pistol in one hand and uh, and a knife in the other. I would want that to be, like, almost literal, as near to literal as possible for the people of Donshire, you know, like, uh, Turning up to, to the, the point where, like, a, a, yeah, you know, to where, like, literally to the point where, um, you know, like, a hundred years from now, our neighbors would have, like, proverbs about, like, oh, those crazy Donshire people, you know, they're born with a, with a gun in one hand and a, and a knife mm. in the other. There's gun ho idiots in, in some middle of nowhere place. Yeah. I go, oh, but they, they know how to make a good steak or whatever at the very mm. least. Um, yeah, but I, I guess in terms of like what we might call like political divisions, I was sort of thinking it might be good to do it on uh, familial or semi-familial lines, you know, to have like a uh, to, to divide the people essentially up into into clans, sort of Scottish style, yeah. and then um, whether the leader is elected or an inherited, that uh, like it might be that there was one family that was just slightly more important than all the others, and that was sort of like the uh, the family of the count or the family of the sheriff. Um. Count might actually work better, because you have Count and Countess. Mm. Like, I guess that just uh, depends. Like, would we want the title of the, li- of, of, the, of the leader to be gendered in that way? Or would we want it to be the neutral sheriff? Yeah. Well, I mean, this is the... This is one of the kind of... I wouldn't say disagreements, but sort of de- debates we were having on... Um, uh, yeah. The kind of title we would have. And the, the meaning of them. So I, w- I, think, I was. Go on. 
I think uh, sort of like what I was talking about, like um, the the symbols of the leader. You know, like a like a male leader would have uh, like a club in one hand and a shield in the other. Uh, or like a club or like a warhammer or something like that. Uh, and that, whereas a female leader would carry a, an enormous drop spindle, you know, like a, like a two foot long drop spindle. Uh, the kind of thing that women in the Middle East used to spin wool. And and a and a cup, you know, like a sort of like a like a like a heavy brass wine glass or something like that. In the other hand, like a big chalice, like a, like a goblet. Um, it might be for that reason we would want to have a gendered title as well, like Count or Countess. Yeah. Well, I mean, as we said, we're barely on the thought experiment stage, so we'll um... Yes. Um, yes, and the thing is, you know, it's like, we're, we're not even... Not Germans. We're not so completely tied to our plans that we'll sort of try to make reality fit them. We're essentially just trying to make a, a thing so that when we actually get there, we're not starting with nothing, we can go. What's it? We're trying to make a plan that we can modify to fit thing when we get there. I guess. Does that sound about right? Yeah. I would say so. Oh, I've got to go for about two minutes, though. I'll be back in a second. Oh. Well, that's all right. I was thinking it might be time to end the podcast anyway. How long have we been recording? Uh, quite a while. Um, what is it? Probably about two hours? I think that's a fine podcast. Indeed. So if, so if, you, if you'd like... Off. Yes, if, if you'd like, we, we can, we can uh, call it quits for the day, and we can uh, write up some more stuff to talk about tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, we can, yeah, that's... It's fine, me. I'll, I'll, I'll see if yes, I'm available or... for tomorrow, but we'll see. All right, uh, cross the bridge when we come to it. Well, not not necessarily tomorrow. Just next time, you know. Maybe yeah. tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Maybe next week. Whatever works. Yeah. Well, um, do you want to end it now, or do you want to carry on for a bit more? Um, at the very least, we should have like I I, I need to get lunch, uh, and you need to do something. Perhaps we can call this an intermission, and if it's convenient for both of us, in about thirty or forty minutes, maybe we can make a part two today. Yep. Oh, sounds good to me. Okay. See you in a bit then. See you in a bit then. <laughs>